A prisoner swap with Russia means Brittany Griner is free, but no vice Paul Whelan is not. And what should we expect from the very new look Lansing? Today is Sunday, December 11, 2022, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint on this December 11th, which means we are exactly two weeks from Christmas, which seems hard to believe. There was hope that it would finally be a homecoming Christmas for Paul Whelan of Novi. He's been in a Russian prison for nearly four years now, and when word broke that a prisoner swap was going to bring WNBA star Brittany Griner home, well, like many others, I assumed Paul would be a part of the deal and finally on his way back home. But it was not meant to be. It did seem an uneven swap, as social media was quick to note. We traded a Russian arms dealer nicknamed the Merchant of Death for someone who got caught with a vape pen. Of course, it was also hard to miss that the more famous American was the one included in the trade. So where does that leave Whelan? We've talked before on the program with his brother David, and David Whelan will join me in just a few moments to talk about where the family's hopes rest now. And then we're going to set the stage for the arrival of the Michigan Legislature 2023. As lame duck sessions go, this one was... Well, I guess lame seems to be the best way of putting it. It did include a farewell speech from outgoing Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky, whose remarks many found baffling. It included everything from an unexplained reference to child sacrifice to a very strange story about putting his hand into a Capitol toilet. Shirky is among those leaving Lansing due to term limits. That means a lot of new blood, but new blood also means not all that experienced in the ways of Lansing. That against the backdrop of the first democratically controlled capital in 40 years. So what should we expect? It's all coming up today on Flashpoint. I want to start this morning with the vigil we've been keeping for far too long, awaiting the release of Paul Whelan of Novi. He's been in a Russian prison for nearly four years, and sadly, he was not on the plane that carried Brittany Griner back to the U.S. this past week. CNN managed to record a phone conversation with Paul just after news of the Griner deal broke. I have to say I am greatly disappointed that more has not been done to secure my release, yeah. especially as the four-year anniversary of my arrest is coming up. I'm happy that Brittany is going home today and that Trevor went home when he did, but I don't understand why I'm still sitting here. My bags are packed. I'm ready to go home. I just need an airplane to come and get me. It is very good to have with me again on the program, David Whelan, Paul's brother, who joins me via Zoom. Uh, David, you have gotten used to dramatic swings over these four years between hope and despair, but uh, this week must have been particularly tough. It was hard. And I think, you know, we'd uh, maybe raised our hopes a little bit too high. Secretary Blinken back in August had mentioned that a substantial proposal had been made to Russia to bring Paul and to bring Brittany Griner home. And uh, I think we were very hopeful that something would come of that. Uh, Paul had even been thinking about uh, where he would live again when he came back to the United States. And I think when you're in his situation and you start to think about the end, um, then obviously your hopes are pretty high. And, and, and so they can fall that much further when, uh, as we learned this week, um, he wasn't yeah. coming home. It was, a, it was, as he says, it was a great disappointment. We, we heard Paul there talking about having his bags packed. Was that a turn of a phrase or, or did he really have the possibility of being released sort of dangled in front of him and then snatched away? Well, I don't know that it was any more uh, than the discussions generally happening. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think he actually had his literal bags uh, and then, you know, was not taken to the plane. Um, I think it was a turn of phrase to, yeah. to show that he's ready. And in fact, I, I think he would probably walk out the door with anything, without anything that he owns in that thing just to get out of the place. I don't imagine there's many souvenirs he wants to keep. Um, sure. But I, I, I know you don't want to criticize or flout the release of any American citizen from Russia. But I'm wondering if it felt to you like uh, Brittany Griner's celebrity took priority over Paul's longer captivity. I don't think so. I think uh, really once you get out into the world and are captured by a, a nation state and held hostage, pretty much all of the things that make you special outside of those labor camps, outside of those hostage taking nations don't matter anymore. You're just another person. You're just another political tool for that country to try and extort something from the U.S. government. And so uh, I think in her case, in Brittany's case, it was a simpler uh case in that, you know, um, it was a smaller charge. It was, it was considered in the legal system in Russia 
as a lesser charge than what Paul had. Uh, and so in, at the end of the day, it was probably simpler to bring her home. And I can completely understand where the Russian government would never have done a one for two exchange anyway. They might have done a two for two. Mm. Um, but a one for one makes total sense to me. The longer this goes, though, because I don't I don't believe you've ever given any credence to the allegations that Russia has made against your brother. I don't think you've ever found any truth at all in this idea that there was some kind of espionage going on. The longer this goes on, though, uh, and given what you just described, do you feel like you're, you're still having to bat those aside? Oh, for sure. I mean, if you watch social media today, uh, Paula's name is being completely torn apart. Uh, uh, he's still being accused of a spy by by Americans, and uh, it, it's yeah. remarkable to, to me that anybody believes anything that comes out of uh, the Kremlin or out of the Russian uh, legal system. I don't even really believe that uh, Brittany Griner did anything. Uh, you know, it's that sort of thing that you just can't trust anything that comes out of that c country. It is, uh, yeah, it's, it's an awful thing, and and it's unfortunate because for Russia, the Kremlin. It wants parity. It always wants equal things. Whatever you do to it, it's going to do right back to you. Uh, and so in Paul's case, if he has been labeled uh, a spy and they really consider him to be that um, for political purposes, then I think it may be that the only concession that the U.S. government can give Russia is a Russian spy. And yeah. I'm not sure if those exist in yeah, well, yeah, well, right. But but you're, you're, we have seen, of course, over the past couple of years, especially, Russia has become a factory of dishonesty and uh, disinformation. It's hard to trust anything that comes out of there. The State Department, though, uh, this past week after the Griner release, uh, did try to uh, engender optimism surrounding the situation with, with, uh, with Paul. I, I asked you before we started here whether uh, in any way you gained any optimism uh, out of this because you saw somebody being being released, which is at least good, uh, you said uh, it didn't really do that, but it showed you a path. What, what, what did you mean by that? Paul has been in Russian custody for four years, and the first two years uh, of his custody, the U.S. government was almost non-responsive. Uh, it took us a lot of effort to get um, uh, the attention of the administration at that time. We had a huge amount of help from people like uh, Representative Stevens, Senator Peters, Senator Stabenow, Representative Kildee. I mean, so many uh, of the Michigan delegation they were the ones that got the ball rolling in government. Uh, and we have seen over the last two years that that evolution has continued in the State Department, uh, in the National Security Council. There's a lot more attention being paid to wrongful de detainees. And in Paul's particular case, uh, we know that the U.S. government put forth a lot of different ideas. Uh, and, and there was regular reporting over the last few months uh, where um, Press Secretary Jean-Pierre was saying things like, uh, you know, the Russians are acting in bad faith. We've been making uh, a variety of different offers to them. So we know that the U.S. government has been very creative this time with Paul's case in ways that they weren't even uh, doing, uh, you know, six or eight months ago when Trevor Reed was freed. So we know that they've exhausted probably everything that they have in their cash register for, uh, for the Russian government. The Russian government didn't take anything for Paul. But I think that the U.S. government is still being very creative and is clearly not going to relent in trying to bring him home. So to that extent, I think, that, you know, I'm optimistic that it will continue, but I think that we may be at a point of a little bit of a reset. The last thing you and your family needed in the middle of all this was Russia invading Ukraine, uh, a Ukrainian army being fully supported by the United States. How much has that complicated all of this? It's fascinating. It's a little bit like having uh, a lot of siblings and you like some of them and you don't like others. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in Paul's case, you know, the prison is isolated from a lot of what's going on. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, government relationship is complicated enough that there are many, many different things going on at all at all times. So although the Ukraine war has had a huge impact, um, the U.S. is still talking to Russia about uh, nuclear arms uh, or is attempting to do that. Yeah. Uh, Russia and the U.S. are talking about, you know, visas for diplomats. There are all sorts of other things going on. And Paul's case has remained one of those things. So uh, it, it's not like the door was slammed shut. It made things perhaps more complicated and certainly a lot more frosty. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it hasn't really sabotaged um, those discussions. It, it is difficult, I think, from the outside for us to understand just how complex this relationship between the nations is. Lastly, uh, David, I, I, you and the family have over the years a number of times been very concerned for Paul's health. Uh, do you have a, 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 an understanding right now? What's your sense of his well-being? Well, we have a good sense, fortunately. The U.S. Embassy was able to go and see him on November 16th. And uh, so they have had eyes on him. They can see what he looks like. He's lost a ton of weight since uh, he first got there. He's lost about 20% of the weight. 
uh, that he had when he was arrested, uh, which isn't isn't good. Yeah. Uh, and the food there is not uh, a healthy diet. So we worry a little bit about his uh, physical health, but he seems to have sort of reached an equilibrium. I think it's his mental health I'm mostly worried about now. He's been doing this for four years. Uh, he has rituals to help him get through the day. He uses his Marine uh, Marine Corps uh, POW training to uh, to survive. He does things like uh, singing the U.S. National Anthem in the morning to, uh, <laughs> to help himself out, to irritate the guards, sure. you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, it's been four years. How do you do it yeah. for five years or six years? Or in Paul's case, he's got another 12 years to go. And I think it can be daunting when you have had such a crash of expectations as we have had this week yeah. uh, to sort of recalibrate and say, okay, I can continue to do this day after day after day. I know Christmas is uh, obviously really tough for you and your family, but David, I so look forward to the day that uh, you and I can talk about, uh, about him being on his way home. I so uh, wish you and the family very well, and thanks so much for the time. Thanks, Devin. I appreciate it. You bet. Uh, we'll come back. We'll continue with more. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. When you're hurt in an auto accident, don't let the insurance company treat you like junk. We'll fight the insurance company and make them pay every penny you deserve. 1-800-CALL-SAM. DTE knows everyone has a preferred setting. Some like it cool, others warmer. Some like things slow, and others like it ASAP. Long, hot soak, or quick rinse. But whether it's a slow simmer or a fast boil, DTE makes sure that safe, reliable, cleaner, natural gas is there for you, making every setting the perfect one. DTE. Whoa! DraftKings, look at all these blackjack games. You got Spanish 21, vacation blackjack, touchdown blackjack. What is this? Some big old Vegas buffet where you're putting the waffles next to the crab legs, deciding what dessert you want for breakfast? Well, guess what? Smack me in the mouth with all of it. I want it all. Download the DraftKings Casino app, the home of Blackjack, and get up to $50 in free credits. Action so good, why play anywhere else? Somebody bring me the cream puffs. You see these cars? There were people in them when they were hit. That's why we make reckless drivers and the insurance companies that defend them pay. Don't let the insurance company treat you like junk. Get the Bernstein Advantage. 1-800-CALL-SAM. If you're not watching Local 4 News, this is what you're missing. He fell asleep with a baby. He was exhausted. Our Local 4 viewers telling us about problems they're having in their community. You were not going to let this hurt you the way he wanted it to. Because I have to keep going on for my children. And next week, expect more stories to help protect you from scams. It's a new crime and it's costing some local people big money. Worth your time to watch every day. Local 4 News. Expect more. Welcome back. Some ducks are lamer than others, and this lame duck session didn't really produce much of note. That's not to say it wasn't important, because depending on your point of view, bills not passed can be as important as bills that are. But plenty of intrigue around the Capitol as we head into the new year and a new legislature. Let's talk about it with Stephen Henderson, the host of uh, Detroit Today on WDET. Dave Boucher is the government and politics reporter for the Detroit Free Press, and Chad Livengood is the politics editor and columnist for the Detroit News. Gang, uh, good to have you all here. Uh, uh, I want to start with this um, parting farewell address uh, by the outgoing Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky. Chad, uh, there's so much that uh, to drill down on here, but it was really strange. But I'll be uh, let me say at the outset, I've never quite figured out Mike Shirky to begin with. He was invited to the White House and refused to bite the uh, the apple of uh, you know election fraud and all that. But then in this address, kind of brought up a lot of QAnon kind of sort of talk what was what was your reaction as you heard him <laughs> with all of that I mean I've spent a decade covering Mike Shirky and I haven't figured him out either I mean, uh, the, the guy has uh, uh, at times he has the the persona of the smartest guy in the room he's an engineer right he's a very successful engineer businessman auto supplier uh, and tool and die industry uh, but at times he just uh, he wants to make his points and uh, this was this was Mike Shirky's last uh, opportunity at the mic 
and he and he used it. I mean, he used the usual farewell speeches to talk about your your friends, your family, your staffs. <laughs> Not all of his staff. He actually mentioned didn't left some out for some reasons uh, unknown. But uh, he yeah, but then he just went into you know, now I'm going to say some things that you don't want some of you might not want to hear. And then he started talking about uh, conspiracies about central banks and and uh, and artificial intelligence, child sacrifice. You don't hear sacrifice. that a lot. Right? Yeah, we no, don't, that's not that doesn't come up at a lot of not too often. We no. don't hear that on the, on the floor of the state senate. So, uh, yeah, it, it was kind of actually what you might, and then a lot of his, his grievances about the pandemic, and yes, I was right, yes. uh, you know, because he was a very, very um, adamant, proud anti-vaxxer mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, you know, refused to go to the Mackinac Policy Conference because right. he didn't want to get a vaccine, and, and, uh, and so he wanted to take this opportunity to take some shots at Governor Whitmer on the way out the door. Uh, Dave, even a story about putting his hand into a toilet at the Capitol and realizing that it was hot water somewhere they were heating the water that was going into the toilets. What was your take on this address? Yeah, he transitioned from, to your point, talking about that time that he told President Trump no to interfering in this election to that time that he put his hand in the toilet (laughs) because he was trying to figure out why the water was hot. It was, and that was arguably the least bizarre part of the speech. It was, to Chad's point, this, this list of grievances that spanned from banks to kids to he he said some very offensive language about the LGBTQ community mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I, I talked afterward to Senator Senator Jeremy Moss he's the right. first openly gay lawmaker about just his take and he said at some point after that speech that Mike Shirky came up to him gave him a hug and told him how proud he was of, of the type of lawmaker he was and after Jeremy, his crack about after, trans what he, he exactly, talked about everything's trans these days exactly yeah, which yeah. prompted Senator Moss to leave the room. And so he spoke to this as just the ongoing contradictions of who Mike Shirky is. And we've seen a lot of comments about this is the person who was arguably the highest ranking Republican government official in Michigan for the last four years. And this is what he thinks. Stephen, it's weird because it feels like we have finally tamped out a lot of the uh, election talk, you know, about the election fraud stuff. The, the, the people that espouse that didn't have a great deal of success, mm-hmm. obviously, in the midterms. Mm-hmm. And yet you hear a speech like this, and you're like, is this QAnon stuff still got as much of a foothold as I mean, it speaks to the fear. it speaks to how much rot there is uh, in the party. I mean, as Dave said, this is this is not just some random uh, elected official. This is the top ranking Republican uh, in the legislature uh, saying these things uh, on his way out the door uh, a month after an election in which uh, they lost complete control in Lansing for the first time in 40 years. You know, the party's got to get itself together. Uh, all of this stuff is the thing, I believe, that's turning voters away and make, giving voters real pause about how much control they can have. He did the party no favors at all, uh, trying to turn the page, perhaps, when they come back in 2023 to, 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 to be a little different uh, with, with this kind of swipe that he took at, uh, at, all these, at all of these things that I think voters are very... Uh, attentive to and very nervous about what Republicans think and what they'll do. It was one thing that managed to get attention during this lame duck session that really didn't produce much. But we'll turn the page too because he is on his way. He's leaving now. As many uh, uh, who've been term limit, uh, uh, everyone who's term limit, not many, everyone who's term limit is leaving now. And Chad, this brings us back to the point that others have made. The problem with term limits is you get a whole bunch of people in there new with no experience. The people that don't move, don't leave, are lobbyists. The power structure that can, it, that maybe has been strengthened by term limits. Your paper uh, and Craig Mauger, who uh, couldn't be with us today, by the way, um, I, I did a terrific drill down on on the power and the role of lobbyists and what uh, they especially were uh, when Lee Chatfield was there. Talk a little bit about what we've learned about. Yeah, we went deep into understanding this relationship uh, the former speaker Lee Chatfield had with. One lobbying firm, Government Consulting uh, Services Inc., known as GCSI, and and uh, Chatville and GCSI were um, basically linked at the at the hip throughout his time as Speaker of the House, and we you know we we found multiple instances where where legislation uh, started to try to get moving because Lee Ch- because Lee Chatville was involved because GCSI was was the uh, main client. And then there's also all these other really cozy arrangements. One of GCSI's longtime clients, the Auto Dealers Group, uh, rented an apartment to Lee Chatfield for six years and never disclosed it in the lobby disclosures. I mean, what we found is there's a lot of holes in the lobby disclosure laws. 
GCSI was 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 uh, was uh, wined and dined uh, on Chatfield like no other speaker in the last decade. We looked at we just compared which his which looks total. really great now, by the way, with the <laughs> problems that he's facing. I mean, we looked at his total uh, for 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 two years, and it was six times what the previous three speakers got spent on them um, in, in an eight-year period. I mean, it was it was kind of astonishing. And you know, then we had people calling up afterwards and saying, "Well, actually, that, that, this can't possibly be accurate. It has to be more." Yeah. And what would the more is that Lee Chatfield maintained um, a, a, a nonprofit uh, fund that people a dark money fund that, that people could donate money to anonymously, and then he seemingly was able to spend it. Uh, and, and there was all this expenditures for Pretty travel yep. and entertainment and 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 meals and such and. And it's, it's it, I mean, we already have documented how he traveled the country during his two-year term as a speaker, kind of living high on the hog, and this seems to be how he's gotten away with it. So, Dave, we know Michigan is a kind of transparency hell for journalists, <laughs> uh, an ethical pit. Does this change anything? Well, I think it's important to note that despite everything that, that Chad has reported on, the House under Chatfield and under Speaker Wentworth passed ethics reform legislation <laughs> that died in the Senate. And so while Mike Shirky said exactly. So Mike Shirky was the one who was seen as the person being the the the, the stopgap here that was preventing this passage. And so in theory, under the new Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate, this is one of those issues that was already bipartisan, at least in the House. And we've been told by Republicans and Democrats in the Senate that if it had actually come up for a vote, it would have passed already. And so some of this stuff is not only lobbyist disclosures, but uh, Freedom of Information Act reforms, yep. so subjecting people in the legislature, the governor's office, other agencies to to that, and, and then just additional disclosure requirements. Uh, in theory, that's something that could gain traction in the next legislative session. It's one thing to, to say you're going to do it versus actually doing it, but it feels like that there could be more actual movement on these issues. Well, and the opportunity is there because of what voters did on November 8th. I mean, passing Prop 2 really does open the door for the legislature to decide how much uh, disclosure there's going to be, what it's going to look like. Uh, they're going to have to do that anyway to kind of animate the, the, the constitutional changes. Uh, I, I think the, the, the reporting this week, uh, combined with all the other things that we know have gone on in, in, in Lansing with... Uh, with uh, not just uh, lobbyists and money, uh, but again, just basic transparency. Yeah. Uh, I, I think voters want this, and, and Democrats would be really smart uh, to jump on that early, I think, next year and, and get it done. Remember, the governor promised uh, that uh, she would open uh, mm -hmm. her office up to, to FOIA as well. Mm. Has that happened? Still waiting. Still yeah. waiting, I think. Uh, Chad, what, let me let everybody uh, weigh in here quickly on what we expect uh, from this new legislative year. First time in 40 years. Demo I, I said, you know, if you're a Democrat, good news is you got control. The bad news is you got control. Right. So now what do you do with it? It wasn't the election results weren't 24 hours old before I was hearing talk of repealing right to work, uh, all kinds of things. And I, I talk, we've talked on the program about uh, the winning party misreading the mandate that they've gotten from voters. What do you expect? Well, it's a very narrow majority, 54, mm -hmm. 56 in the, in, the, in, the, in the House, 20 to 18 in the Senate. Yep. There's not a lot of room for error. They have Democrats and senators and reps from marginal districts where they could be vulnerable if they go too far to the left. I, I would expect them to kind of uh, govern down the middle a little bit. But one final point on, on, the, uh, on the term of Mike Shirky here. Sure. Um, instead of, of trying to do something meaningful in lame Duck, use your time on the clock that we're paying you to do and whatnot, and and negotiate with the governor in good faith and whatnot. They just orchestrated some cats and dogs bills and, and then had these these you know uh, parting shots in this speech. But Mike Shirky left six billion dollars on the table for for uh, Gretchen Whitmer and the Democratic majority next year to spend. Uh, I mean, I, one one longtime Republican lobbyist I ran into in the hall uh, on Wednesday said, "This is malpractice uh, for the Republicans just to leave this money uh, laying around yeah. and have no say in it, and, and next year they they will have little say in it." I'm running out of time. Got about 30 seconds. There. Yeah, what do you Democrats, expect? they're absolutely going to repeal the 1931 abortion ban. We already had the, the proposal that was passed, but this is something that voters obviously want. I think they'll probably also codify protections against firing or evicting people due to their sexual orientation or gender identity. Mm -hmm. Again, we had a court ruling to that effect. But this is something that would have passed in the legislature had it come up already. These are relatively easy wins that most Democrats support.
Stephen, quickly. I was 12 Please. last time Democrats had this much power. Uh, I'm 52 now. I've learned a lot since then. I hope they have, too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Guys, thanks very much for the conversation. That's terrific. Uh, wrap things up for Flashpoint right after this on Local 4. Inflation has made food too expensive for some families to afford. After paying for housing, paying for health care, paying for transportation, there may be very little money left for food. With food insecurities on the rise, Forgotten Harvest is there to answer the call. We're working to feed over 700,000 people this year. We want your support to feed our neighbors in need. Act now and show your support at ForgottenHarvest.org. And together, we can end hunger. Save more at the year-end mattress sale, only at Gardner White, and get free delivery before Christmas. Save up to $1,700 on top name brand mattresses. Plus, get 0% financing for 60 months. Plus, free TVs, free power bases, and free MasterCards. Get a king or queen price cut to $9.99 on Serta Perfect Sleeper, Beauty Rest, or Sealy at the year-end mattress sale, only at Gardner White, Detroit's number one mattress store. The future of television has arrived. Next Gen TV is here. Immerse yourself in stunning video. Feel the power of movie theater quality sound and consistent volume across channels. Get the most out of live coverage with enhanced internet content. Next Gen TV, designed to be upgradable with the advancements of tomorrow. The future of television has arrived. Learn more at watchnextgentv.com. Think as if it were you on the other side. If I see something good around the country, we're adopting it. It's, it's hard. We are really, really close to a tipping point. That is astronomically insane. Solutionaries, the creative thinkers and doers working to make the world a better place. Subscribe at youtube.com slash solutionaries. That's going to do it for us, but gentlemen, you've teed this up perfectly because next week my guest on Flashpoint will be none other than Governor Gretchen Whitmer. We'll talk about what she expects out of this new, uh, different version of a legislature in Lansing. Meet the press coming up next. We'll see you next time on Flashpoint.